Hello, I'm Mike Buchanan, and I'm here with Elizabeth Hobson to interview Paul Elam, the keynote speaker at this conference and a legend of the men's rights movement for many years. Elizabeth leads the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them, j4mb.org.uk. I launched the party in 2013 and I led it until six months ago. It might be a cliche to say it, but this speaker needs no introduction. So there's a short biography about Paul and links to his websites on the conference website. Paul, a very warm welcome. Thank you for being the keynote speaker at this conference, the sixth conference in the amazing series you launched in, in Detroit in 2014, where I had the honor of speaking and the pleasure of meeting some of my heroes and heroines for the first time. There are 120 speakers at this event, about the same as the previous five ICMIs combined. There's a link to the presentation videos playlist of all six conferences, including this, in the low bar. So Paul, can you give us your thoughts on these conferences and explain why they're so critical for the global men's rights movement? Well, first of all, thanks, Mike and Elizabeth, for having me here. It's an uh, absolute pleasure. I'm wearing a 2014 conference t-shirt in honor of this very important event. I don't think we can overstate the importance of these gatherings. Uh, one of the problems that men face, in, especially those men who are aware of men's issues, who uh, care, have care about them and compassion for them, is that there are few and far between. People are isolated. I mean, we have to connect from across the pond to maintain these friendships, these connections with each other. And so one of the magical things that happens with every conference that we've had is you have this huge gathering of men and women uh, in person, and they're walking around in rooms full of people where everybody's on the same page. Or, or very close to it and where they're connected. And they're so different from what regular life is like because most of the time, it, at least in the sense of being connected to people of like mind, we feel isolated and we are isolated. We're disconnected from each other. So the primary things that I've always loved about the conferences is to be among friends, to spend a few days together with people who don't think I'm crazy, <laughs> and who aren't pointing fingers at each other and who aren't shaming each other, but instead supporting each other. The speeches are great. They're wonderful in many cases. And, and sometimes we find, you know, hidden gems among those speeches that uh, we would have never stumbled on were it not for somebody organizing a conference. Uh, and that's always wonderful. But the mainstay of these things, I think, is that they help preserve sanity. I see every time I've attended one of these conferences, I've seen men and women walking around elated, mm. to connected to each other and, and sharing a joy that you just don't see in our, for lack of a better word, our red pill world. Mm. Uh, so I think the connection is huge. And I think, Paul, it's also, <clears throat> I mean, I'll be talking later on about uh, um, Laura Bates and her God awful <laughs> new book, Why Why Men Hate Sorry, Men Who Hate Women, that was it. Um, but um, so so she talks about the men's rights movement, but to my mind, if you want to <clears throat> I mean it's a it's a nebulous, largely online movement, of course, necessarily. But if you want to understand what the what I would consider the the, the mainstream, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, men's rights movement, you, you need to check out ICMI videos. And, and, you know, so we have, um, I think the previ previous five, there are about 120 speakers in total. Uh, there's 120 at this, so 240 videos. And I would defy Laura Bloody Bates to, to find one, um, one, one, one sentence of misogyny in God knows how many hours, what, 240 hours of speeches. She won't find it. Um, and, and also, I, I think, uh, compared to 14, I think um, I think just uh, you know the understanding in the men's rights movement about feminism and gynocentrism and so on has just come on leaps and bounds. It's 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 astonishing just just how fast people have developed, um, you know, and they're kind of coming together. With the, I mean, I can't think of any great disputes in the men's rights movement today. I, um, 
No, I, you ha, I think you have to understand the men's movement as a factioned movement. We have several different groups. For instance, the people that are working on shared custody for mm. children, uh, for equal time parenting with children, both in Europe and the United States and uh, indeed across the world, represent a contingent in the men's movement. And many of those people would not necessarily identify as men's rights act activists, but that is in effect what they're doing. They're trying to change laws that are, are onerous and punitive uh, to men. And they're working very hard at it and they're starting to make progress. Then you have a faction of men who have said, look, we're done until the laws change or, or, or until marriage becomes a safer institution for men, we're done with this. And this represents the MGTOW, I think is part of the men's movement. Now, a lot of the, again, a lot of the guys there would not say I'm a men's rights activist, but if we look at where men are going, as a reaction to gender feminism. This is a reaction to it. It is a movement that is in reaction to a, a lot of what feminism has created in the world. So they can't be discounted as part of the men's movement. Then we have authors, writers, bloggers, people who work on changing the narrative, which is another subset of the men's rights movement. And I think we're a lot of success uh, has been realized. You see this in the conferences because there is a, a mode of thinking, a philosophy that is drawing a very diverse group of people together to express concerns about the, the same ideas. Uh, and that is another part of the men's movement. And I think that uh, I would dare say, and I'm very proud of it, uh, that regarding men has begun exploring out and even developing another part uh, of the men's movement. And that is being of service to men, reaching out to men across the globe, helping them connect to each other live in real time in formats like we're, we're talking on right now. And it's become magical. Uh, the men have come in in great numbers. They are meeting every day of the week online face to face. And you don't see any of the typical sort of, uh, you know, with the internet and anonymity, it's a hostile environment. It's amazing what happens to men when they're in an environment face-to-face -face with each other, talking about their issues, talking about just their opinions or, or whatever they wanna speak about and connecting on that level. You don't see the flame wars. You don't see the hostility. What you do is see men supporting each other, which is what men do if you put them in an environment where they're not going to be shamed. So there is a lot of different factions of the men's movement. Even PUAs are a reaction mm -hmm. to what's happening in gender politics. Uh, I don't agree with a, a lot of sort of the gynocentrism involved with PUAs, uh, but at the same time, they are a bona fide reaction to gender politics of the day. So we have, whether people want a men's movement or not, it's there. And we're talking about many, many hundreds of thousands, if not more men in one way or another and women who are reacting to feminism, who are reacting to the current arena of sexual politics. And I don't think it's stoppable at this point. Uh, I'm, I had no doubt when you set out to do this conference and getting 120 speakers, I knew you would get it done. Uh, I absolutely knew you would get it done. And you could probably have shot for 200 speakers mm -hmm. and gotten it done. Um, this is uh, my view, my overview of what's happening of all these disparate factions of people reacting in one way or another to the reality of gender politics of the time. And we're part of that. And so are a lot of other people. And you're beginning to see this mainstream as well, too. Yeah. Uh, just before we come to Elizabeth's first first question, Paul, just like to pick up on a couple of things you said there. On the MGTOW, um, I, I, I'm sort of um, a bit unsure as to whether I identify as MGTOW because, you know, a 62 year old guy without money you know, it's probably a MGTOW whether he wants to be or not. So, uh, <laughs> or at least the, the woman, you know, the, the, the women that I would love to date are not going to date me. So, um, you know, that's that's sort of accepting of reality. But no, I, I think both of us kind of admire 
these, you know, the, the, the you know, an, an awful lot of big towns. And we have a big town speaking at this conference for the first time. I'm very pleased to say, um, Sydney. Big Wonderful. Town. So uh, he, he has a great following. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And yeah, he's thing, a good guy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the other thing is uh, regarding men. I think that's a, a, an outstanding initiative, mm -hmm. just outstanding. So for anyone who doesn't know, it's regardingmen.com. It's, it's the easiest website you are, uh, you know, um, thing to remember. Remember, And my, my 90 minute one, which is at 2, 2 p.m. on um, uh, GMT on Sundays, is, the, is one of the high points of my week. It is, it is not work. It is just, uh, you know, uh, um, it's just pleasure. And, 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 you know, we see the same guys time again. And uh, it's, it's extraordinary, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of friendships building, building week after week. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see, especially in COVID times, I guess. Yeah, I think in, in, in some ways, unfortunately, I mean, I say this very cautiously, that the, the pandemic, uh, as we have described it, uh, uh, actually facilitated mm. so, some of this. Uh, and when we're isolated, in real world terms from everybody, the opportunity to connect online in that way is a lot more appealing. The rest of the world is doing it too. But I want to go back for a moment to something you said about MGTOW. You know, uh, you could say, well, I'm 62 and I, I don't have money. So uh, the women I want to date uh, don't want to date me anyway. Therefore, I'm in sort of uh, a MGTOW whether I want to be or not. I think there's a lot more to it than that. And, you know, a lot of what I see with MGTOW men is that everywhere they go, even in platonic or business relationships, they don't buy into the gynocentrism. Uh, they're not going to be guided by that. They're not going to have their decisions and their outlooks and uh, their public presentation dictated to them uh, by a feminist establishment or a gynocentric mm -hmm. establishment. They're standing on their own. Uh, we're talking about, when we talk about MGTOW, people like, like Thomas Edison uh, and uh, Einstein, when, when you really look at his life, uh, great, great men chose this path, whether they called it MGTOW or not, because they were too busy actually accomplishing things to dedicate their lives to sex and women. Um, and that mentality in MGTOW, I think, is unleashing a lot of potential in men. Uh, to accomplish great things and to live lives that are satisfactory to them. So I would disagree with you, Mike. I, 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 I hope you wear a MGTOW proud shirt <laughs> before this is all over with. I do. So, I mean, certainly I really enjoy the not having the stress of an intimate relationship with a woman because I look back and I think, oh, I just see stress, stress, stress everywhere. Um, Mike, are you implying that intimate relationships are a source of stress for men? They said, well, they are for me, that's for sure. And, uh, <laughs> I suspect, um, yeah, all men, pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's, um, okay, it's time for uh, Elizabeth's uh, first question. Yeah, before I um, ask my question, actually, I, I would like to pick up on, you know, you talking about the factions of the broader men's movement and um, also the... Um, you said that the men's movement is unstoppable. And I've been thinking recently, you know, that one of our, one of the really great things, which I think attracts and keeps hearts and minds within the men's movement is that unlike everywhere else in society, we can disagree with each other respectfully and passionately and, you know, still love each other at mm -hmm. the end. I think that's one of the most fantastic things about our movement, actually. You, you I agree with you. I, the PUAs, they're not going to agree, but man, they can have a great discussion. Absolutely. And, you know, the more that we work on connecting each other as much as we can in real world terms and face to face meetings like this, the more of that phenomenon you see of a, a, a lot of different ideas different political views, different races, different everything. And it, I mean, all you gotta do is attend one ICMI mm -hmm. conference in real world terms. And you'll know that, uh, you know, the Laura Bates in the world who try to portray this as a white male over 40 movement is utter and complete bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, it is not anything like that at all. And I agree with you, that's my experience. I do see, unfortunately, 
And I think with time, this will probably heal too. The internet is not the best environment for human beings to operate in. Uh, I mean, it gets better when we can see each other and when we're more familiar with each other's histories and personalities and uh, vulnerabilities. That tends to help situation, but the, under the cloak of anonymity, you see, it's like Twitter. <laughs> you see the same thing. It's, it's, it's like, all of a sudden, two people who agree on, on much will disagree on dotting an I or crossing a T, and the next thing you know, everything's burning down. Uh, but we are getting there, and I, I think the technology is catching up to this, and you know, eventually when we get uh, uh, out of this pandemic, I think we're going to see a new world for MRAs and, and red pill men and women. Uh, in their connection to each other, because I, I, it's time, I think we're ready and we're facilitating that in many ways now. Yeah, I think we'll all be ready to get together in real life for sure. I can't count the number of times I've said, yes, we must go for a beer after all this. <laughs> I, I wonder, Elizabeth, this, this issue of the friendliness in the men's rights movement, mm -hmm. um, that's come up with a couple of, in, in a couple of our other interviews um, of, of women, yeah. And uh, including Michelle and, um, and and the lady we interviewed yesterday, I wonder if you could just say, just say a few words about your personal experience of of feminism and the men's rights movement. Yeah, well, you know, I went to feminism because I thought it was a benevolent movement about equal rights for a start, but also because I was really attracted to the idea of finding a sisterhood. And I found a load of cliquey, horrible, neurotic, bullying, abusive women mm. and a few men. Um, and then I came into the men's movement and I have found my sisterhood in the women who are advocating for genuine equality and compassion and for at promoting the well-being of men, women, children. Um, and, and I've found, you know, brothers too. It's been absolutely wonderful. And, you know, I, I can't even count the number of mentors I have, you know, men who um, help me with my work and help me to see different perspectives. And it's been so valuable, I can't even say. And I'm absolutely filled with gratitude for being part of this movement that's so supportive and so wonderful. Isn't it amazing the difference between a philosophy or ideology that is really about scratching and clawing for as much power as possible versus a movement that is actually focused on identifying and solving problems that harm people? Um, this is, you described it perfectly, Elizabeth. There's no sisterhood in, in feminism. There is be obedient and follow the narrative or suffer for it, or you will pay uh, with cancel culture. And in the men's movement, we are a much broader tent. Now I must admit, and I support the idea we aren't very tolerant of feminist ideas. We've tried these out and tested them, and we've seen about how well they work with uh, what probably 40, 50 million cat ladies in the United States that are got one toothbrush hanging in the stand, four cats, and screaming about where all the good men went. Mm -hmm. um, that's what feminism did for women in my country. And I've seen the same thing, Elizabeth, in, for men's rights activists and those people, there is much more of a sense of ease with each other. And there isn't any ideology that you have to follow. I mean, we have some core beliefs. We think that men suffer in silence. We think that there's a, a host of issues that men face that aren't being addressed in, in the cultural landscape right now. And we would really like to see something done about it. But that's about <laughs> the level of entry requirement you have, not so with feminists. 
you have to be the Laura Bates type who, mm -hmm. you know, you know, Mike, you said that uh, uh, she sort of fabricates things. Gus, she fabricates everything. Uh, I read excerpts from her book. And this is typical. This is, I mean, feminists have been fabricating research, fabricating problems, fabricating severity of problems, uh, fabricating the world's reaction to their problems. We live in a world that literally launches itself into women's issues every day in a panic, trying to fix them. And yet the advocates for women are constantly saying that the world is out to get them. Uh, it, the, the departure from reality in this, I think, is part of what, what undermines possible real sisterhood for women that become a part of the feminist movement. If everything you're doing is predicated on lies, then you have to lie to each other. And if you have relationships where you have to lie to each other all the time, then how intimate and connected are you going to be? That's just my take on That's it. That's a great, great point. Um, and I wonder how much you'd agree with the statement though that feminism is just one head of a many headed beast that's threatening our civilization and our flourishing and our well-being at the moment. Yes, I agree with that statement entirely, except I think uh, uh, with the caveat to say that it is a very large head indeed, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, bigger than many of the others. Uh, I think feminism provides a good target if you, you want to pick apart information and get analytical about all of these issues that face men and women, what's severe, what's not severe, what's real and what's not real. Feminism is a great, great place to go to debunk the BS. But there is an under, and I've thought about this, there's an underlying problem of gynocentrism, of course, which is by and large real. And at the same time, I'm not sure that society would benefit from blindly removing all gynocentrism. I mean, we do, I think, have an investment in protecting, for instance, pregnant women uh, and their children. I, I think that's a wholesome, healthy investment for a society. So there's a tad bit of women first that I think goes a long way to protecting children and to ultimately stabilizing a society if society can ever get around to supporting the idea of marriage and families instead of undermining them the way they are now. Um, but I wouldn't just go willy-nilly cutting out any evidence of gynocentrism anywhere. Um, I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, and that I think is important to recognize. Uh, I realize there will be people that will disagree with that, uh, but having looked at this for, well, almost every day of my life since 1993, that's the conclusion that I come up with. Can I just add to that, Paul? I think men have a major role in protecting unborn children. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, people don't want to say it. People don't want to hear it. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference to me. Abortion is a men's issue. Mm. Uh, absolutely bona fide. It's inarguable. It's a, it's a abortion a, is a men's issue. Yeah, it's the it's the top of the list next to me, Paul. Uh, I don't I don't have any contention with that list. Um, we're talking about well, and there's so much more to the abortion issue than than just sex. I mean, we we set up Planned Parenthood clinics all across the United States, particularly in black neighborhoods, because we're a society that's fond of terminating black pregnancies. Um, and this, of course, comes originally from Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, whose intention it was uh, to use eugenics to weed out the black population. That was her, yeah. her purpose in that. And, and it's been, icon. What's that? I said, and is now a feminist icon. So Absolutely. Mm. And so, but I, I just wanted to point out, this isn't just a gender issue. It's also a racial issue, mm. at least in America it is, because you know, we have something to the effect of one in six black babies have been killed. 
uh, over the past 50 years, it's absolutely sadistically insane to operate this way. And of course, in order to set things up this way, the, the first thing they had to do was to disempower black men in, in black families, to kick them out. We, our government pays women to have children while having a father removed from the home. And then if they have too many children, they just abort them. Um, it, it's, a, it's absolutely sickening. It's, and, it, you know, it's beyond a Holocaust, Paul, isn't it? I mean, in the UK alone, it's, um, um, it's, it's now, I think last year, that it's 53 years since the Abortion Act of 1967. 10 million unborn children murdered. Yep, and, and in the same period, 60 million in the United States. Yeah. And every year, another 200,000 culled. Yes, uh, it is. It's, a, it's an awful, awful problem. And I do think one of the ways that the men's movement needs to mature uh, and to co really come into its own is to, to, to be discussing this issue much more prominently and being much more vocal in our objection to the practice of murdering children. Um, but look at it this way. We've had to really, it's taken us a while to even come to terms with the idea of to stop mutilating sexually baby boys. Mm. And we've only begun a real discussion on that in recent years. Um, and we're still not talking about the murder of all these children. And it's, um, yeah, I think it's to our, our shame that we haven't done more with this, but I do believe we will. I do believe as, as time Ooh. passes, as men and women organize more, I think the voice of, uh, and, and it's a very definitely not that women don't protect children, they do, and, but it is men's natural instinct to protect children. Uh, that's what, in many ways, what we're born to do. And we need to have more of that voice in the men's movement that is actually protecting children, not just genital integ integrity and bodily autonomy, but life itself. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree, Paul. I, I raised abortion in my, um, <clears throat> in, in my Chicago speech last, last year. And, and um, I was expecting some, some criticism of, of saying, you know, abortion is a men's issue. Not one person in, in the intervening time has said uh, that it's a mistake to present it as a men's issue. Not, not, not one, not one. Okay. And it's not, it's, it's a mistake to not to. So, I mean, when, when you said that uh, it'd be a mistake to throw out gynocentrism, my first response was like, yeah, we should keep Mother's Day and that's about it. <laughs> But actually, you know, the fact is, we know that it's hardwired mm. and it's here to stay. And so, you know, I wonder whether, and actually I think we can, I think in the men's movement, we can be champions for women because we're protecting the men and boys that they love. And because, you know, if we're talking about abortion, so if there's one in six, black babies being aborted. I just can't believe that all of those women are not at all traumatized by that. You know, they are. the, the, it's, it's a sort of, um, it's a perspective that, you know, feminists push away and they try to keep out of the mainstream media, but it's not too hard to find women who had abortions and, absolutely you know are, are traumatized by what they've done and so you know maybe maybe yeah we sh we can keep presenting and it's like you know the rape culture thing it, it takes women who didn't feel violated tells them that they were and suddenly they feel traumatized and scared you know and that's because feminism it doesn't care about women's well-being. What it cares about is being able to expand this kind of female victim class so that they can exert more power over legislation, policy, the minutiae of um, interpersonal interactions between men and women. 
so yeah I think the men's rights movement we are standing up for women and we do and we should point out as often as possible that that is what we're doing and feminists are doing the exact opposite feminists are harming women about the gynocentrism and I think this is a really healthy discussion to have between men and women with things we should talk about when I'm talking about keeping a certain amount of gynocentrism, what I mean is uh, I'm in a committed relationship. If I hear something go bump in the night in my home, I am going to be the one to go look into that. I'm the one that's more capable of physical aggression. I'm the one that's gonna handle that situation better in the same respect. If we're doing work around the house and it involves picking up something that weighs 60 or 70 pounds and, and moving it upstairs, I'm gonna be the one to do that. And uh, that is, I think, what I call rational gynocentrism. Mm. Uh, I can do the job better and safer in those cases. And my partner does other things in favor of me to, to compensate for, for that about it. So it, it does work out. I'm not talking about being Captain Sabaho and, and rushing out to defend women's honor or to give them privilege. They've got enough privilege. Uh, uh, I don't wanna add any more to that. But I do think in practical terms, there is some room for a little bit of gynocentrism in relationships. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add a sentence or two on that. Um, it's interesting, uh, I think you said gynocentrism, gynocentrism is hardwired, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's one of the speakers, I can't remember who it is now, who disagrees strongly with that. He says it's, uh, it's not hard. Uh, so, so he says it's, 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 it's um, you know, it's, it's very, very much a cultural thing. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to, uh, on to my next question. Paul, as we're recording this, Donald Trump has yet to concede defeat in the US presidential election. Understandably so, at least for people who don't get their news from left-wing sources, such as the ABC, BBC, CBC, and all the way down to ZBC, the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation. Legal cases may go on for some time. I think it's fair to say the vast majority of MRAs would support Trump over Biden, and they hoped for men's issues and boys' issues to start being addressed in the second Trump term, possibly with the creation of a White House Council on Boys and Men. Dr. Warren Farrell expressed exactly, exactly that hope when Elizabeth and I interviewed him for this conference. If, if uh, Biden uh, officially becomes president-elect after the legal cases have run their course, how would you expect a Biden-Harris administration to impact on the men's rights movement? And perhaps you could say a few words about a related issue, MRA deplatforming on social media, and even in your case recently, removal from PayPal. Well, there's a lot in there you, you laid out to unpack. Um, it, yes, the election is still contested right now. 70% of uh, conservative Americans don't believe in the results that they're being given by the media. I don't believe the results that were being given by the media. I think a Biden-Harris administration for men in general is a freaking nightmare. Um, Biden has promised day one he's going to go back and reinstate the Dear Colleague letter, removing due process for young men on college campuses. And he's proud of this. Uh, he can't wait to remove due process for, for young men on college campuses. It's, it's going to be an awful situation uh, with them. Um, I hope Warren recognizes and I think he probably does. The chances of a Biden administration uh, embracing an, a White House office for boys and men is non-existent. Mm. It's the very thing. And if he had had that office put in place before the election, Biden would remove it. He would kill funding for it. It, it would be over. Uh, a Biden administration, a Harris administration, or, or it might, for all we know, it's a Harris-Biden administration. Yes. Um, <clears throat> not good for men and boys at all. Uh, a terrible occurrence. Uh, and, you know, Donald Trump's record has been really good in many ways, but not absolutely perfect in, in some ways. For instance, um, 
in his tax cuts, one of the changes that happened that wasn't discussed much in the media is that if you're someone paying alimony or child support, and I'd say the odds are pretty good that you're male if you happen to be a person paying child support and alimony, uh, there used to be tax exemptions for that. They were removed under the Trump administration. Um, not only were they removed, women who used to have to pay taxes on income received from their marriages no longer have to. Wow. So wow. The, the, the burden was shifted. Um, and I see this and I be, believe me, I believe in Trump's message. I believe in the guy and I think he's trying to do the right thing. After all, he scratched off the dear colleague letter and did many other things to try to support young men. And he publicly recognized that young men were living in dangerous times, which was stunning to come from an, an American president. Uh, but the whole scenario is not perfect still. I think we'd be a lot better off with a Trump administration uh, than a Biden administration. I know we would, uh, only time will tell. Thank you, Paul. Elizabeth? Right, yeah, well, just, just a little question here. What is your 2020 vision for the men's rights movement? Well, I want to go back for a moment to explain this. I want to go back to the idea of the factions, that in understanding that the men's movement overall, if we're talking simply about the social movement of men in reaction to gender politics and the, and the sexual landscape right now, we have the PUA contingent who have reacted we have MGTOW who have reacted. We have MRAs who have reacted. We have family law advocates who have reacted. All of these are different parts of that. And I want and I hope that all these things continue in earnest because all of them one way or another, even in, on the PUA end, guys are learning to rethink themselves and re re see themselves differently than they did before they were red pilled. And that is a very positive thing. I can only speak with any authority to my little corner of this movement itself. And I believe the future is in each other. I really do. That our priority must be to connect with each other in real world terms, to form social networks in, in, in real world terms that give us a place where we belong and where we're not made to feel like we're crazy and where people will pat us on the back for speaking the truth rather than shame and humiliate us. And that's what I'm trying to do. Shameless plug here for regarding men. Janice Fiamingo is very involved. Tom Golden is actually the cornerstone of, of, of building regarding men, all the technical work and everything else that he's done to bring this together. And it's what we're finding is that there is a huge hunger for this. These guys show up, finally, I'm somewhere where I'm not nuts and I don't have to wait for an ICMI. I, it's like an ICMI every day of the week. Mm. And that is a powerful thing. Uh, so I think, and what we're going to do post COVID is we're gonna be planning retreats uh, we've had a Voice for Men retreats before. We uh, met in, 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 matter of fact, Mike was at one in Colorado with us. And um, we want to plan a lot more of those post COVID. And, and now we have the, already the building social connections to do it. So you're going to see much more regarding men. You're going to see social networking. You're going to see retreats and connection between men and women who just don't wanna live crazy lives under feminist doctrine. And I think that alone scares the living hell out of feminists. Mm -hmm. uh, people that they can't control with shame and humiliation and bullying. The bullying that Elizabeth talked about seeing as she entered into the sisterhood. I mean, I, what a joke of a word that is for feminist sisterhood. Uh, they are women strong arming each other and, and, and people around them to obey and to bow. I, I've said for a long time that, you know, you've seen, you've seen the placards and you've seen it online that feminism is for everyone. Well, guys, 
that's that's not an invitation to belong. That's a command to obey. Feminism is for everyone and you will obey it. Mm -hmm. um, we can beat that in numbers, but we have to be connected. Mm -hmm. So I'm dedicating, honestly, the rest of my life, as long as I'm sucking air, I'm dedicating it fully to creating these connections, to creating groups of men and women that can come together regarding men for participants as men only. And we need to start out this way. We need to have male space. It's one of the things feminism has robbed. I mean, they've invaded everything uh, all the way down to women in the men's locker room at sporting events. And But if you try to do the reverse, uh, God help you, uh, you would be in prison. Uh, but creating male space this way and then translating that online male space into real world male space for men. Once we get that stabilized, then we can talk about men and women connecting with each other in that space too. And I think that could be a beautiful thing. I really do. I think I agree with every word of those sentiments, Paul. What I wanna say about regarding men is one, it's very cheap. Uh, we do have levels of membership that if you're if you're good with cash and, and, and things are going well in life for you and you would like to kick in extra money to help us continue this platform, you've got the opportunity to do that. But the base membership, which gives you the same level of access as any other membership is $5 a month. Um, and that is for literally dozens of hours of what uh, amounts to something that is better than mental health treatment for men because mental health treatment for men is just not what it should be these days. We also have scholarships available for men who are broke. You know, a lot of men come to this movement <laughs> in very, very bad straits. They've been, uh, had terrible judgments against them in family courts. They've suffered false allegations. They're spending all their money on legal fees or they're even past that. They've, they've exhausted everything. Some guys living out of their cars and you know, coming in to join from the library. Um, it, it's, it's really unfortunate. So for those guys, we do have scholarships. I want every man out there listening to this to know that we're not gonna let a dollar stand in between our services for men and your need for them. If, if you want to join regarding men, there is nothing to stop you from doing that. Um, you can come right in, you can go to regardingmen.com forward slash join, and you will see at the bottom of the page that there's a scholarship link. There's also all the other options, and we, we really do appreciate the people who join and pay because we are running several Zoom accounts, and, and uh, there's other expenses involved with this that we'd like to cover, but we're not going to turn down any man from belonging to this over money. So don't don't even think about that as an issue no that, that's great paul thank you and uh, qu quite apart if you like you know, from the sort of the mental health side although i suppose it is related um i don't think i've ever laughed so much in meetings in my born days as in the you know we we we, we i won't say it's uh, you know three quarters of the meeting but my god we laugh a lot and well, I, I like to say the people ask me uh, is you know, regarding men, mental health treatment. No, it's not. It's better. Yeah. It, it, it's like mental health treatment, except without all the feminist bullshit. Yeah. And we, 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 with added laughter. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Uh, and, and it is so good. I should say something about that. To hear men congregating and laughing from the heart, from the belly. I mean, and guys that are coming from false accusations, from bad divorces, from parental alienation, from all the problems that men face where there's no support hardly at all out there in the world, to come there and find a place where they're that comfortable and where they are that connected to each other is proof of the pudding for me. And all you got to do is attend one or two group meetings and you'll find out. Agreed, agreed. Paul, you and I were both attacked recently by one of the most dismal human beings on the planet, Laura Bates, AKA Special Snowflake, of the Everyday Whining Project in her ridiculous new wine book, Men Who Hate Women. For me, Paul, it was like being attacked by Little Red Riding Hood. 
while almost everything Bates wrote about us was misleading at best, I guess there's no such thing as bad publicity in this stage of the, of the development of the men's rights movement. Elizabeth and I have both critiqued sections of the book in separate videos and challenged Bates to a video discussion. Paul, you'll be astounded to learn that Bates has yet to respond. We, we enjoyed your video interview by the man who runs the amazing Glass Blind Spot YouTube channel. Paul, I know you're a huge admirer of the, of the high profile women in the movement, such as Janice Fiamengo, Karen Strawn and Elizabeth. So is pretty well every MRA that I know. Female MRAs and anti-feminists are, are all intelligent and beautiful and often funny too. In the same vein, of course, male MRAs are intelligent, handsome, and irresistible to women. As I, oh, said, yeah. as I said to Karen Strawn in our interview with her for this conference, it's a cross we learn to bear. It occurred to me that I might put up background images illustrating the size of the gap between the characters of female MRAs and the characters of feminists. The first image is of the Colorado River Canyon in Arizona. For some reason that utterly escapes me, Americans refer to it as the Grand Canyon. I don't know why Americans think it's so special. The Thames River Canyon that runs through the heart of London is over twice the depth and almost three times the length, but you don't hear Brits boasting about that. <laughs> this is an image of Elizabeth taken 18 months ago, looking at the group of hostile male and female feminist protesters who would later try but failed dismally, to drown out our speeches on the first floor of a lecture building at Cambridge University. We gave the protesters the name Cambridge University Noisy Twats Society. The acronym seemed, seemed appropriate somehow. I'm sure it was accidental. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I wonder if, you could, if we could have your thoughts on the differences between feminists and normal women. Wow, it's uh, I'm sure more profound than the difference between the Grand Canyon and, and the Thames. <laughs> Certainly, uh, uh, this picture, uh, they say a picture says a thousand words. I agree with that. This picture says a lot. Feminists are bullies. They're just bullies, pure and simple. And like all bullies, they're cowards. There's no such thing as a bully who's not a coward underneath. Uh, Laura Bates, for instance, um, mm -hmm. really should have titled her book, Men Who Hate Women Like Laura Bates. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's another matter. No, seriously, this picture won against the world in a way, or at least the, the crazy faction in the world, is the, it's the contrast not only between MRAs and feminists, but I think between all normal people and feminists. Now, in contrasting them with women, we still have some similar issues to, to address. I mean, to be honest and fair, we have to look at the, at the enormous amount of female privilege in the world, of female entitlement, what we inculcate into women, their expectations are crazy unrealistic expectations of men to be everything and nothing at the same time. Um, it, it is a very frustrating experience for men and, and I think the men's movement does a good job of addressing those issues, beginning to talk about them and decent, wonderful women uh, like Elizabeth here, like Deborah Powney, like Suzanne McCarley, like Karen Strawn, Alison Tiemann. I mean, we, we don't really have a shortage. And of course, the amazing Janice Fiamingo. We don't have a shortage of that, but you have to understand to be honest and, and truthful that Elizabeth and Janice and Suzanne and the others are not normal women. They're not what men have to deal with in with normal women is a problem. Mm. Um, I'm of the mind that the only way most men are going to have a good, healthy relationship with the average woman is if she can learn to let go of some of her privilege and her expectations and understand that she's connecting to her human beings with, with dreams and feelings and passions and desires that are just as important as everybody else. Unfortunately, we do need to teach women. We need to socialize into them. 
that if you peel back a man's skin, you don't find gears and wires. You find flesh and blood. And we can be hurt. We can be devastated. It's why the in normal times, the suicide rate between men and women is four to one. And during breakups, it's 11 to one. Um, we need to look at that, look at the dynamics between men and women and begin to change that. And I think two things that we need to do to do that is one, to teach men their own worth uh, and to assert their own worth and their own needs and relationships and to teach women to accept that there's going to have to be give and take. They're going to just about what princess wants. And it's, it, I mean, and that's harsh language. And I know some women find that language offensive. Sorry about that. You know, the truth often hurts. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of the situation. But I can't say that I'm looking at that picture behind you, Mike, that I'm looking at the average woman. No. On either side of the fence, the women that are trying to bully Elizabeth there are freaking nuts. They're not cases uh, out to try to do this because to bully because they can. And Elizabeth is taking a trek there that, that very few women would dare. I think we need to honor that. That's why when I get the comments from guys in my videos, it was a get rid of the woman talking about Janice Fiamingo, who wow. has done more to spread a better narrative about men's issues than any of these guys ever dreamed of doing. Um, uh, so we've got a lot of education <laughs> to tackle. And that includes some men who I think have gone overboard on making sure that they reject and diminish and look down on anything female. I agree. I think the, the, the women are just so important to the movement. And something- Yes, they are. Is, 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 is Anti-feminism is becoming cool among women. Um, Karen Strawn, two years ago, was asked at the Q&A in London, what would have to happen for, for more women to join the movement? And she said it would, it would have to become cool. And I groaned at the time. So I thought, well, that will never happen. But my God, two years on, it's unbelievable. Um, just, you know, you, you have, you know, women like Ava Brighton just coming out of the clear blue sky. It's and, you know, there was something that Stefan Molyneux said at the very first conference back at, uh, in 14. He said, in order for us to have a change about feminism, like just like with Nazism and, and racism and a lot of other evils, is that the first thing that happens is that you have to recognize that it's evil. That when, when evil is recognized, it is forced into another form. You know, I grew up in, in Texas um, where racial slurs were a part of, in, in my younger days, were an everyday part of life. I mean, that's just the way people talked and now they don't anymore. Why? Because we recognize racism was evil. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you do recognize the truth about feminism, that it is an evil, <laughs> it is a, a movement hungry for power and for especially for the power to abuse and control others. Once you recognize that feminism is e evil and, they, and people mm -hmm. are starting to recognize mm -hmm. that feminism is a hate movement and yeah. it's evil, that once that goes on, that evil will have to go somewhere else. I mean, it never disappears. When, when evil gets confronted, it retreats and then it pops up in another form. But it's gonna have to pop up in another form other than in, in gender issues. Once we recognize that it's evil and we are on our way to a society that recognizes that feminism is an evil. I, I, and people like Laura Bates are evil. I, I, There's something wrong with them. I, I agree. Um, yeah. And once we get there, anti-feminism will be much more cool uh, than it is even right now. And we're seeing it happen. I think we're living in the times where this is, is going to happen in front of our very eyes. There's a very good uh, speech by a female MRA. I won't, I won't name her um, in, in this conference. And she, she at one point talks about... Um, uh, she says, in my view, 50% of women in the developed world 
have BPD. And then she, she then she sort of looks to one side and says, who am I kidding? It's a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and her point was that feminism has, has kind of, has, has, has released women from the need or, or the need to behave like good human beings. It, it's, it's turned them into monsters. Well, and it has embraced them acting like monsters. It isn't just relieving them of accountability. It is encouraging sick, abusive, hateful behavior um, because feminism is a hate movement. There's, yeah. It's not a disputable fact. I don't think I would be willing to debate anybody on that subject that wanted to, but I don't think it's disputable. We're dealing with a hate movement. And just like all hate movements, it starts out with a, a, a tolerance and legitimacy around it. The KKK was no different. The KKK was doing parades in Washington at, at one point uh, and was endorsed by politicians because it was embraced as something good, even though it was something evil on its face. Yeah. Feminism is the same way. I, I, I would urge people to... Um... To, to, to watch the, the Mallory Millet interview in which she, 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 she explains that Kate Millet, um, but, you know, the, the, the authoress of uh, sexual politics back in 1970, was, was, she said, you just didn't see women around like that. So today I see Kate Millets everywhere. Everywhere. They're, they're, you know, her, that, she planted that seed, which has developed into the most awful awful thing but uh paul, paul uh time is starting to run a little bit short i'm afraid i'd like to um wrap up by thanking you for a number of things the the most obvious one is um to thank you for your amazing work over just so many years and uh, um, everyone who watches this if they haven't already got a copy of uh men women relationships they should they should correct that and, and buy a copy as well as the you know a number of books that you've that you've uh, you've co-written and I, ha I have a friend who, who is much enjoying Say Goodbye to Crazy because he's, he's just had a relationship with a woman who, um, you know, well, was... It was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's, it's the perfect book for him. Um, I'd, like you to, I'd like to thank you for starting the ICMI series, which has been just so, so important. And I, I just love working on ICMIs. It's, it takes up quite a bit of my year and I don't, I, I, and I never resent a single second of it. It's... It's, it's fascinating. Um, well, to be fair, and we're going to have to be fair here, uh, people should know how much of a role you've played in keeping ICMI alive over the year, of making sure that it didn't disappear. And I know you don't like public acknowledgement. I've, I've known you for some time now, but it's going to be said anyway. If it were not for you, ICMI would not have continued. Thank you, Paul. That's very kind. I shall have to edit that out, obviously, because um, that, that, that would be a crime under British law to, 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 to have something nice said about you in a, in a video. <laughs> um, yes. I, I'd, like, I, I'd like to uh, thank you for your friendship. And uh, on, you know, on a number of occasions, you know, you've given me just wonderful advice on various things. Um, so hugely appreciate it. And your unswerving support of J4MB since we launched in 2013. Has been has been a joy, and uh, it's been a pleasure to support your work and a voice for men. Likewise, the feelings mutual. Thank you, Paul. About you and Elizabeth. Okay, again, that's going to have to be cut out. Mm -hmm. um, and fi finally, just say um, I, I, I very much hope, and I'm sure everyone watching this video hopes that you'll be doing your important work, as you say, until you stop sucking air. I think was the uh, was the expression. So, uh, you, so, 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 thank you for for giving us some reassurance on that. No problem. Like I said, when I quit working, you'll know I'm dead. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. It's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.